Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video where today I've got a doe case to share with you. This is the case of the two Sumter County does, one male and one female, unidentified homicide victims found in Sumter County, South Carolina on August 9th, 1976. They'd each been shot three times, once in the throat, once in the chest and once in the back. The gun was believed to have been a .357 calibre revolver. I'll start with individual descriptions of each doe before going on to talk about possible identity theories and murder theories. It was the early hours of August 9th, 1976, around 6.20 a.m., when a trucker named Martin Durant came across two bodies on a secluded Sumter County dirt road between Interstate 95 and SC 341. The truck driver had pulled off to a rest stop on Locklear Road, just off the interstate, when he came across them. He immediately contacts an employee at a nearby store who was the one to go on and contact the authorities. A local man describes the hermit, claimed that in the early hours of the morning he'd seen the pair from a distance. He said that they'd exited a car on Locklear Road, which is where they would later be found dead. Some reports suggest this hermit heard the gunshots, but apparently he didn't see anything and he didn't go back to check. We'll start with a description of the female, who is usually referred to as just Sumter County Jane Doe. She is estimated to be between 18 to 25 years old. She was white with an olive undertone, five foot five and around 105 pounds, so very slim. She had brown, medium length hair and her eye color is a little bit unclear. Namus says that her eyes were hazel, whilst the Doe Network says blue gray, blue green or hazel. She had a few distinguishing marks in the form of moles. She had two small hair moles on her left cheek and another on her right. She also had a mole on the back of her right calf. She had pierced ears and no surgical scars and also very naturally long eyelashes. There tends to be a lot of focus placed online about the fact that she also had unshaven legs with people suggesting this means she might have been from South America. I'm not really sure how relevant that really is though, seeing as this was the mid 70s, feminism, free love and all that, a lot of people just chose not to shave their legs. I find it odd that there's actually a lot of weight placed on this. Um, but she's also described as being very beautiful, like very naturally beautiful. Her teeth didn't give many clues either. She had no elaborate dental work done and she was missing her upper and lower wisdom teeth on the right, but the ones in her left remained. She had fillings in all of her back teeth, so she was probably the kind of person who looked after herself well and took regular trips to the dentist. She was found wearing cut off blue jeans, a pink halter top that tied in the front and an unbleached muslin blouse. She was also wearing a pair of stride right wedge heeled sandals with lavender, pink and purple straps. She had on three silver rings that resembled handmade jewellery, possibly Native American or Mexican in style. They didn't look particularly expensive, just costume jewellery made from sterling silver. One has red and blue stones with a curved feather detail, another has a long oblong dark blue stone, and another is a wide set band with three pale blue stones. She didn't have anything else on her, no personal belongings when she was found, and she was also found not wearing any underwear. The male victim is often referred to as Jock Doe, for reasons I'll cover shortly. He's estimated to be a little bit older than the female, between 18 and 30. He looked very young in the face, but the forensic dentist who examined his teeth said that he believed that he was over over 27 years old, so perhaps he just looked a lot younger than he is. I can relate. He was white, but again with very olive undertones to his skin, six foot one and 150 pounds. He had brown hair and brown eyes and a few distinguishing marks on his body. He had a four inch appendectomy scar and two two inch scars on the back of his right shoulder area. Doe Network states that he was possibly a player of contact sports, judging by the scars on the back of his shoulder and his very athletic build. I couldn't find any further elaboration on that or why a couple of scars in the area would lead them to that conclusion, but I'm sure they think it for a reason. He had had very extensive and elaborate dental work done. He had a crown on his left front tooth made from acrylic or porcelain, and he was missing his bottom wisdom teeth and had fillings in most of his upper teeth, as well as some missing teeth in the top and the bottom. The fact that a top back left tooth was missing may have been very noticeable when he smiled. He was wearing faded blue Levi jeans, a red t-shirt with Cause America light beer on the front and Camel Challenger GT Sebring 76 across the back. The top had most likely come from the Cause sponsored Sebring races that had just taken place in Florida. The race had happened quite recently and this suggests that the pair, or at least the man, had definitely been in attendance. Perhaps they were on their way back from the race when they were murdered. But this isn't a given of course, there's always a small chance he picked up the t-shirt in a thrift store or something like that. 
He was also wearing a Belova Accutron gold watch on his left hand, made by Belova in 1968. However, the company actually destroyed its records, which have all been paper, of course, shortly after this when they downsized. So no one knows exactly where these watches were distributed. It was an expensive watch, but not super expensive. It wasn't a Rolex or anything like that, but it was expensive. He also wore a 14 karat gold ring with a grey star stone that had the initials JPF engraved on the inside. Just like the Jane Doe, he also wasn't wearing any underwear. And in his jeans pocket, there was a box of matches from Grant's Truck Stop. Now, there were three Grant's Truck Stops in the USA at this time. One in Idaho, one in Arizona, and one in Nebraska. When the information about the pair was eventually released, a man who worked at Grant's Truck Stop in Nebraska claimed to have done repairs on a car with an Oregon or Washington license plate owned by a couple matching the pair's description. It's believed that Jock Doe came from a wealthy background. He wore expensive jewellery and had expensive dental work done. He seemed to be about halfway through a complete dental restoration at the time he died. The American Dental Association published the findings of the forensic dentist in the hope that a dentist somewhere would recognise the work, but no one ever came forward. Despite the fact they had no money on them, investigators were under the impression that they were fairly well to do. Both of the victims were found to be clean and had showered recently, in the 24 hours before their deaths at least, and they actually looked fairly alike. At first investigators thought there was a chance that they could be related, even siblings, but later testing proved otherwise. Autopsies found no drugs or alcohol in either of their systems, and each had recently eaten fruit, possibly with ice cream. A man believed that he'd actually seen the couple eating at a local fruit stand just off of the Florence Highway shortly before the murders, but he couldn't remember if they were with somebody else or if they had a car with them. Also, I couldn't find anywhere that specified how shortly before the murders this was. Does it mean the night before or in the very early hours of the morning? Because you've got to remember they were found at 6.20am. When the victims were found, their faces were largely undamaged, and so there are very clear post-mortem photos online. I don't usually include post-mortem photos in my videos or anything graphic whatsoever, but I am going to include them here. They're not graphic at all, but look away now if you don't want to see. This is a doe case, so it's important to share their actual faces alongside sketches of them, just in case someone recognises something. A few months after the murders, an employee of KOA campgrounds near Santee, South Carolina called the authorities. He said he believed that he'd made friends with the man before he died, and that he went by the name Jock though it's likely it actually may have been Jacques, which is why he's now referred to as Jacques Doe. Him and his girlfriend stayed for a few days at the campground before leaving for Florida, which makes sense considering the t-shirt he was wearing was from Florida. They then stopped at the campground again for a few days on their way back. The two men became friends in the time they were there though, and Jacques told the worker that he was the son of a prominent doctor in Canada, who had disowned him for giving up on his own career in medicine. He was travelling the USA aimlessly, he said, taking a vacation of sorts, just a break from life. Before leaving the campground, he actually tried to sell his expensive ring to the worker, which was the same ring that he was found wearing when he died. Due to his name likely being Jack, which matches with the JPF initials engraved on the ring, and the fact that he told the worker that his dad was a doctor in Canada, it started to look pretty likely that he was Canadian. But there was more of a mystery around the girl. Was this somebody he met on his travels, or did they know each other beforehand, possibly from Canada? As I said previously, a lot of people suspect that she may have been South American, and a lot of people in forums online seem to think that she looks Argentinian to be more specific, or even some people say Middle Eastern, but all of that is pure speculation. As far as I'm aware, this worker never mentioned anything about either of them having an accent other than North American though. In 1977, a man called Lonnie George Henry was arrested in latter South Carolina for driving whilst intoxicated. The police found a gun in his car, a revolver, the same kind that would have been the murder weapon in the Doe's case, and they immediately suspect this. The serial number on this gun had been partially filed away, which was immediately suspicious. It was testified by investigators, and it was proven to have been the exact gun that killed the couple. So Henry takes a polygraph test, which ends up showing that he was being truthful, for the most part. According to the polygraph test, he didn't kill the couple, but he was lying about where he'd got the gun in the first place. Apparently, a relative had given it to him for his birthday, so the police follow up on this, and the relative says that yes, they did give it as a gift, but when they gifted it, all of the serial numbers were intact. 
And then Henry confesses to filing the numbers off himself but never says why he did it. Just a whole roller coaster. It seems like the police never arrest him or anything and then he dies in 1982 without providing any further information. So this just became a complete dead end. One thing, maybe the only thing we know for sure about this murder is that robbery doesn't seem to be the motive. Both the victims were left with jewellery on their bodies, including Jock Doe with his expensive watch and ring. So unless the person got interrupted before they could take it, which is unlikely considering the time of the day and the secluded location, then it's likely robbery had little to do with this. They must have had cash and personal belongings like other clothes and toiletries on them if they were travelling though, and none of those things have ever been found. The prevailing theory seems to be that it was a carjacking. It's assumed that the two must have had a car if they were travelling across the country as Jock said. Perhaps they began driving down the road to head to the rest stop, or maybe they got lost and somebody approached the car with a gun. So both get out of the car, leaving their possessions in there, only as they do so they both get shot and murdered. The murderer then takes the car and all of their possessions along with it. They must have had money in there also, so maybe the person would have been bothered about a few pieces of jewellery when they had probably wads of cash in the car. But then there's another theory often suggested in this case, which speaks of the couple being involved in drug smuggling. This is probably due to the way in which they were killed. The three bullets and execution style murder is synonymous with a mafia style hit. It was discovered years later that drug smuggling was rampant within IMSA racing and it's likely that the victims had attended an IMSA race shortly before their deaths. This was the big time though, this was huge organised crime and there's actually no evidence other than the strange style of death that points to them having anything to do with drug smuggling. No drugs or anything were found anywhere near them or in their systems. Henry Lee Lucas's name is also mentioned occasionally in connection with this case, as he often is with unsolved doe cases. He told police himself that he was in South Carolina on the day the victims died, but as he was a serial killer with a penchant for false confessions, it was never taken too seriously. Henry Lee Lucas claimed to have killed hundreds of people, but he was only ever convicted of 11 before he died in 2001. For a while after their deaths, the bodies were kept at a funeral home in caskets with airtight see-through lids in hopes of somebody coming forward with an identification. People from all across the country called to inquire about them, but no one was able to identify them and they remained on display until their bodies started to deteriorate and they could be no longer. On August 14th, 1977, one year and five days after the bodies were found, they were buried at Bethel United Methodist Church Cemetery in Oswego, South Carolina. Although they remained unidentified, hundreds of people attended the funeral and law enforcement raised hundreds of dollars to pay the funeral home. Their gravestones simply read, male unknown and female unknown. In 2007, both the bodies were exhumed to obtain their DNA and it was only at this point that the theory that they were siblings was disproved. People were really surprised. They looked so similar that it had always just been assumed that they probably were. On July 24th, 2019, the DNA Doe Project posted on their website that the Sumter County Doe's DNA was undergoing testing. And thanks to multiple donors, the case is fully funded. I guess now it's just a case of waiting, either for somebody to finally recognise their faces or for the DNA to flag up a match on a genealogy database. The DNA Doe Project are doing so many incredible things at the moment when it comes to identification of Jane and John Doe's. So I'm really hoping they come through once again with this one. If Jock Doe was telling the truth, or if he's even the same person, he has a wealthy doctor father who lived in Canada, who likely would be missing a son. We have no information about the girl's background though. There are two families out there who are missing a member, and I have full faith that the DNA Doe Project will do everything they can to reunite them with their identities. Authorities made the decision to halt the investigation until the victims could be identified, so it's possible that their identification will lead to the whole case being solved. I'll leave the details of the Sumter County Sheriff's Office down below in case anybody has any information that could be helpful. As I always say, I think Jane and John Doe cases are amongst the most important stories I tell on this channel. I think just getting the word out there, just sharing their faces, sharing their stories could lead to somebody remembering anything. So if you can, make sure you share this video, especially if you're from around this area in South Carolina. Let me know if there are any other Jane or John Doe cases you'd like me to cover and thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.